Municipal governments are local elected authorities. They include cities, towns, villages, and municipal districts. In the political trenches, local government at work, we dive into the top issues facing local governments across Canada. My name is Christopher Brown, host of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown, and I am joined by my co-host, Ian McCormick, president of Strategic Steps Incorporated. Today, we bring you the letter G, which stands for Good Governance. Later in the episode, we will sit down with local municipal consultant and author George Cuff. But first, we have some of the big news stories making the headlines across the nation when it comes to local government. Ian, how are you? Good to see you, Chris. It's uh, nice to be back on G already. Let's get going. Exactly. So we go to our very first story, which we are heading to Kamloops, British Columbia. The new mayor wants candidates who lost last year's municipal election to provide their input as sitting council prepares for strategic planning. Mayor Reed Hammer Jackson said he is considering reaching out to the candidates who lost in the last year's election for their input. He is quoted as saying, I've never been to a strategic planning meeting in my life. Why not get more ideas? Ian, do you think this is a good idea? I do think it's a good idea. I've, I've thought of it before. I've thought uh, candidates who haven't won. I've also thought maybe of uh, people who retired after the last election, too. To me, people who put their name on a ballot are people who are interested in the life of their community. So to, uh, yet when they don't get as many votes as somebody else, they are they go back to being a normal person but they still have probably the same kind of passion. So I do think there is a role for this. However, they didn't get as many votes as everybody else. So I don't think they should have any more power or authority than any other uh, stakeholder, if you like. So if you are going to get some input from your staff in the municipality, from service clubs in town or from athletic groups, maybe actually getting some input from people who who were interested in being around that council table is an interesting way to go. And yeah, I kind of applaud this. To me, when the mayor, though, admitted, I've never been to a strategic planning session. Well, first of all, the one he's going to will actually be the best one he's ever been to. It will also be the worst one he's ever been to, but that's beside the point. However, if if the mayor, the new mayor, who was elected in BC last October, so has less than six months experience, and if never been to a strategic plan, maybe he's never served in an elected role at all. So not really understanding what he's what what's necessary, uh, asking for input from a variety of different people seems to make a lot of sense to me. In my conversations with local elected leaders for the cross border interview series that's launching later next month, um, we have sat down with councillor candidates and mayors who say during election period they will write things down that. People, when they go to the door, they'll write down the issues and they'll hand them over to the CAO. I'm assuming other candidates who, like you say, were not as successful are doing the exact same thing. So they may have a wealth of knowledge that council may want to actually look at or even uh, look through to see what the priorities that they may not have heard during the last municipal election. Yeah, and I, I would actually divide that almost into two groups. Ones are the kind of those legitimate people who are seeking a seat on council and for whatever reason weren't uh, weren't successful, but had some really good ideas and were interested in long term governance of their municipality. The other group of candidates are those people who are single issue candidates or who are mad about something or don't actually know what the job entails. Those people probably still have things that they want to say. But I wonder about the the efficacy or the legitimacy of that. Um, doesn't mean you shouldn't get information, but some will have, I think, a reasonable understanding of, of what the role of governance is. Others may not. So uh, both sides are, are, are equally legitimate. So providing those ideas to the municipality, either through, as the mayor is saying, some sort of a consultation or survey, perhaps, or sending them in is one thing. But I have also spoken with city managers who have said that their job is to run the community, to run the to run the city uh, on a 24, 24 hours a day. Uh, they don't pay as much attention to political input or what's on uh, campaign brochures because most of what they do is keeping the organization running. When it comes to what's on a brochure, chances are that's about change. What's different about the city, say, four years from now than before I got elected? That's the job of the politicians. So while the city manager may be aware of that, it's unlikely the city manager is going to act on it without direction from those people who actually did get elected. So 
it's it's a it's a legitimate source of input, but not something that's going to direct a municipal manager. A Sandwich, British Columbia councillor is proposing that fines should be based on how much money a person makes rather than just a flat rate. He is quoted by saying, so if you fail to yield for a pedestrian, you get a $121 ticket. Failing to yield to a bus is a $368 ticket. There's two problems with these fines, he said. And continues to say, the first is that they disproportionately punish people with lower incomes. And the second aspect is they fail to adequately serve as the deterrent to the extremely wealthy. Ian, setting two levels of fines for people, is that a smart idea? Well, first of all, I don't suppose it would be two levels of fines. I think it would probably be a percentage or a proportion. Uh, So... It's an intriguing idea. I know it's done in Northern Europe in some places. I think some of the Scandinavian countries I've heard have have done something like this for traffic fines. Some of these things, of course, would be provincial responsibility. Some of them may be local responsibility. So if you're having different orders of government uh, assigning value to fines uh, differently, that could lead to confusion too. So it's an intriguing idea to talk about that. What's the background behind why we would find somebody is to avoid repeat behavior, to say this is something that we ought not to be doing. If, uh, if I'm receiving a fine that really has no impact on me, um, then on my financial situation, why do I care, right? If I've got to do a rolling stop through a stop sign, I get a minor fine, no biggie, it's, mm, I'll just probably do it again. But if it's a major fine or the risk of a major fine, then because my 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 income is higher, maybe I do think twice about doing that. Uh, So there is some legitimacy to it. I think there's some interesting complexity to it as well. But it is a recognition, as the councillor had said, of the punitive nature of a fine being the impact and a a differential impact based on somebody who's got a higher income than versus somebody who's got a lower income. So there's a philosophy behind it, which we have to adopt first before anybody would actually move ahead with a consideration like this. With amalgamation and consolidation becoming more and more common in municipalities across Canada, staffing issues have begun to arise. The former treasurer of the now defunct village of Minto is challenging her termination from her role announced without notice two weeks before the community was merged with another to create the new municipality of Grand Lake, New Brunswick. Ian. As municipalities begin to look towards consolidation or amalgamation, do municipalities need to take a hard look at staffing? And by doing so, do they need to look at the role and not the person in the position? Starting with the end of that, uh, well, the short answer, I think, is obviously yes. Uh, at the higher up you are in an organization, so if this takes place below at the CAO and below, so it's purely within the realm of administration rather than council, um, the executive decision making that a CAO has to make, to me, involves the pieces on the chessboard. Do you want you have to take the person out of that? You're looking for a set of skills. So when you are looking to populate a different municipality, you need a, you need a complete chessboard, if you like. So those set of skills. When it gets down below that level of CAO, though, then we have, I think we put the C, sorry, we put the humanity back in, the individuals who work for the municipality too, and we move, say, from executive decision-making down to management decision-making. And what we find in all types of combinations of municipalities, you made reference to uh, to amalgamations, or in this case, consolidations, it would be the same thing with an annexation or a dissolution or some of those other things too. Fundamentally, to me, though, what happens is we don't change, in many ways, we don't change the actual frontline service delivery. Because if you combine two like towns, we'll use the town of Diamond Valley, uh, which recently amalgamated two other towns of Black Diamond and Turner Valley. There's still the same route for garbage pickup. There's still the same number amount of streets that need to be cleaned. There's still the same kind of recreational programs that need to be offered. So my suspicion is that those frontline people are probably still required, maybe there's some shifting around because the departments change. But as you start moving up in the organization through first and second and third level managers and up to executives, a municipality that gets two or more municipalities that get combined don't require multiple CAOs. They don't require multiple CFOs or directors of community service. So some of those management roles, I think, 
are the ones that are more apt to be moved, removed, uh, that sort of thing that is likely to happen in any sort of consolidation. And the reason for consolidating in the first place was probably to look at greater levels of efficiency. And greater levels of efficiency probably means fewer people at the top end of things, uh, even whether that's something that the, the consolidation is done voluntarily by cooperative municipalities or in the case of these New Brunswick ones that you referenced was um, highly recommended or led by the province. We saw that in uh, in Manitoba as well and in some in Ontario too. So I th the very high end, don't need two CAOs, very high end does have a significant change the very uh, the, the frontline people, I don't think has as much of a change pending. Before we get into our interview with George Cuff, I just want to take a um, quick moment and say that there was a untimely passing of a Quinty West councillor uh, earlier this month, uh, a councillor for Ward 2, Terry Cassidy. Now, Terry Cassidy and I go way back to my first year as a journalist back in Belleville, Ontario, and he was the first council that I had to cover, Quinty West, and he left a lasting impression on me because he was always the one that never said anything in council meetings, but always wanted to talk to the to the actual journalist afterwards to give his thoughts on the record. So um, I, I wish his family all the best during this uh, deep, dark time, and I could not be the person, the journalist I am today without Terry Cassidy, Councillor Cassidy, uh, at that council table in Quinnia West. So with that, we'll be right back with our interview with the George Cuff. I'm looking forward to it, uh, Ian. Uh, well, everybody, welcome back to uh, the Political Trenches. And this week, because we are following alphabetical order, we're doing G. And G, we thought about, is G is for good governance. Who better to talk about good governance than George Cuff, who many of us know, anybody who's been involved in local government in Canada over the last few decades will have interacted with George in one way or another, either through some of his writing or publications in, in, in magazines like Municipal World, or direct interactions at conferences and other events, or working with individual municipal governments and other organizations too. George is uh, commonly known as kind of the governance guru of Canada, and it's a real honor to have George on the show with us. George, welcome. Thanks very much, Ian. Appreciate being here. And of course, to you, Chris, I... as well. George, we'll, uh, we'll kick off a few questions here and hopefully have a bit of a good conversation, too. I'd be interested in knowing, I know a little bit about your background, of course, but uh, how did a boxer become a mayor and then become Canada's preeminent <laughs> local government consultant? What's the similarity or the thread that runs through all those? I tell people that when I was a youth, I grew up in West Edmonton, which was called Jasper Place, which was a town of its own until 1964. And if anybody knows the history of the Jasper Place, you either had to learn how to box or how to run. And so I learned how to do both because my eyesight was starting to fade. And uh, so uh, those skill sets, I think, have served me well in terms of the consulting that I've done, as well as the uh, role that I played as mayor for 12 years. So. That was a part of it. I always had this streak in me that said that I was going to be independent. I had a streak in me that said that I wasn't going to get pushed around by anybody, uh, that I had a steel spine, which, of course, is literally not true because I'm being told that it's not quite as steel as I thought it was. Uh, but I just decided that you know, there will be other people that are going to come along that are much nicer than me, like Ian McCormick and others, and uh, they would be people that councils would find easy to talk to. I'm probably not as easy to talk to, but they do know uh, that if I say something or write something, that from my perspective, it's the gospel. And uh, I th I've never written otherwise. I've never spoken otherwise. Sometimes that doesn't land well. But for most of the clientele I've had, that's the one thing that they comment on, is that uh, they appreciate the fact that I speak what I see to be the truth. Uh, I, a lot of the things that I did when I was younger, I was a, worked for the Royal Bank. I worked for Atlantic Richfield the Oil Company. It, it, both of them in junior accounting roles. I hated it. Uh, decided I needed to get out, uh, went to university, came out with a degree in rec and men, had an honors BA with a specialty in recreation administration. During the time I was at university, I spent every summer and every evening working part-time with uh, Parks and Rec for the city of Edmonton, um, ran a playground that was notorious. The playground shack had been burned down twice. Uh, all the equipment had been stolen. 
And so they put me in there along with this young lady. I said to her, you look after the young kids, I'll look after the old kids. Well, the old kids were about 18 or 20 years of age. And I eventually had to recommend uh, having a boxing match with a couple of them. I thought that might sort of put some order in the place. And fortunately, I had a little kid on the playground who knew his brother used to spar with me. And he said, don't box with this guy. So I eventually developed friendships with these young guys who were all thieves and notorious robbers in the neighborhood and uh, got along fine. And again, my background kind of came into play. Went from that into Spruce Grove, from that into work for the province in environment as well as communications, uh, recreation consulting. I went from recreation consulting uh, into management consulting. And about the same time I became mayor in Spruce Grove, uh, we had a study done by the then firm of Woods Gordon, Clarkson Gordon. When it was over, sometime not, not that much longer afterwards, I got a contact from the leading partner who asked me, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And I said, I don't know, but it's not going to be government. And he said, you're, it's right, you're right. He said, you're going to work for us. And that's when I launched into management consulting, which was 79. And five years later, they were going to pull the plug in the Edmonton office because of the terrible Alberta economy at the time. And so I decided to set up Cuff and Associates. I thought the one thing I know how to do is I know how to consult. And I know local government as well or better than anybody else that was in the business at the time. And so for me, it just made good sense. So that's kind of in a nutshell. I want to jump in and ask a question that might be in the same vein as what you just answered. But in your opinion, George, what is good governance? What is good governance when it comes to municipal, local politics and government? That's a, you know, for as often as I've taught this uh, subject and consulted on it, I very seldom get asked that specific question. Uh, good governance is, in my mind, the net result of a council providing leadership on key community issues in a way that reflects what's in the best interest of the community and reflects and is the outcome of a sound decision-making process that involves quality advice from an administration, apolitical advice, and quality thinking and leadership and process of decision-making by a council. That's good governance. In a nutshell, it's the quality of corporate decision-making as a reflection of who we're we serving, who are we serving, where we're serving the community as a whole, as opposed to individual groups and sectors and so on. So good government is the net result of a decision-making process that involves quality input from your administration, quality advice, involves quality process of decision-making so that you're not rushing everything to an agenda and then to a decision. You're giving yourself time to think it through if it's a big item. And then you're coming out with an answer on an issue that reflects what, in your opinion, is in the best interest of the public will. And there's a, an American author named Walter Lippmann, and I've quoted him lots of times, who said that the public will is what people would choose if they saw clearly, thought rationally, and acted benevolently. That's the public will. And you need people at a council table that can do that, can take all of their other baggage aside and say, what's in the best interest of our community on this issue? That's good governance. I'd like to just throw in a bit of a plug here too. Some of the couple of the tools that George has generated over the years that I found really helpful in this kind of realm are George has a set of good decision making principles, which I think really resonate. And another one that George has developed is around the CAO uh, Council CAO covenant about if you do this, we'll do that. About realistic expectations before things start to go wrong. So just a a plug and a thanks for to George for that though. Uh, I will move on to another question, too. You obviously have learned a ton over the years, having met with good, the bad, and the ugly. You also are well known as an author of books and of columns, as a conference speaker and that sort of thing. Uh, what is it that got you moving from just consulting into writing as well, and writing at a pace that none of us can keep up with, for that matter? You know, I, again, it's, it's, a lot of it is self-observation. So when I was at university, uh, nothing uh, made me feel better than to have a prof say, right, well, we're going to have to have a term paper on this of uh, minimum length of four pages or whatever. And you need to have at least researched it out of four or five texts and da-da-da-da-da. And here's a topic. And you can hear this collective groan through the classroom with one person standing there and saying, yay, that sounds, that's right for me. Well, that was me. I was the person that liked writing term papers that nobody else did. I go to the library, I'd find five books on organization theory that all had the right kind of 
topic around it. I dig it out. I look through the first paragraph in most chapters because that's where all the essence of good information was. I'd quote some particular line with the author and the prophet be absolutely amazed that I found all this material. Well, I probably did that in the first hour or half hour of my research. And then I'd build the, I'd build the paper around it. And I liked writing. And I had uh, a father, at least, that would say, you need to learn to spell correctly. You need to use good grammar. And so I don't remember a whole lot of other things that I was taught other than try not to be a thief, which I was for a while. And don't, you know, don't lie and do all these other things. But uh, the idea of good grammar was important to me. I liked writing. Most people didn't. Mm -hmm. Other kids would end up doing much better building a bookcase or fixing a bike. I couldn't do either one. So I thought I better learn to do something. And boxing eventually was going to fall apart. And so was my track career. And so writing seemed to fit naturally. So I started writing in the, believe it or not, the mid to late 70s. And by the end of 1970s, I was writing articles for various magazines across Canada. And I'll tell you a funny story, including one that was in in Alberta. It was called the Municipal Councillor uh, with the proper spelling of the word council. And, uh, and uh, during the days of Jack Davis, who was then deputy minister, the economy went down the toilet. And so he was looking for ways to cut the budget and they came in at their staff came in. And one of the things they said was we publish this magazine four times a year uh, that has a variety of people writing it like Cuff and others and da, 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 da. Well, we think we should cut it to two times a year rather than four and that'll save us whatever amount of money. And Jack said, why don't, why don't you cut it all together? And they did. And they didn't receive any phone calls in complaint. So that was kind of an indicator to me that maybe my degree of perceived importance wasn't quite as lofty as what other people, what I thought it was as compared to what other people saw. It. So I don't know, I, I started back then and then eventually I kind of morphed into stuff that Municipal World like, they contacted me and said, would you like to write something for us on a regular monthly basis? And I thought, geez, I don't know how I'm gonna last longer than four or five months. And here we are 420 articles later and I'm still writing. Uh, but I'm getting closer to the end, Ian, so uh, anyway. Yeah, I, Chris, you won't know this, but uh, George has heard it before. When people ask about me, I just say I'm, I'm kinder and gentler and cheaper than George. But other than that, pretty much the same. In fact, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure about the cheaper side, but the kinder, gentler side, I'm probably, <laughs> it's probably accurate. Shots fire. <laughs> uh, I'm going to throw in another one here while we're kind of on this topic. You've no doubt heard the term getting cuffed. Yeah. How do you respond to that when people talk about, well, we got cuffed or we're about to get cuffed? What do you, how do you, how yeah, do you do I, I tell people you don't need to worry about me coming into an organization if you have the confidence of the people above you and if you're not screwing around the organization. You're not deliberately doing stuff that you know to be inappropriate. Right. So have the confidence above you, i.e., if you're a department head, make sure the CAO uh, has your back and believes in you and so on. If you're a CAO, make sure council and majority. Uh, believes that you're the right person if you have those two things if i come in and find out that that's not true and it's more frequently than not that it's the cao that's fumbled the ball and the council's lost faith in the person or whatever and never had it to begin with if that happens and i do this study and i find out that there's a lack of confidence i'm not going to leave the organization and say you guys ought to have a group hug and this will all get better the answer is it never gets better i don't care who you want to talk to it just doesn't get better you need to make a decision and people know that and they know that I'm likely to write the benediction. And so they often would call me without telling me, by the way, come in and fire somebody. I've never once had anybody say that to me. I've had them say, come in, do a review, tell us what you think needs to be done, including the province of Alberta. The only time they tried to tell me who to fire was an ADM by the province. I'm not going to tell you what department. Uh, and I said, you go ahead and do the firing. I'll do a review. But if you already know the answer, you go ahead and proceed and I'll do some work beyond that. I don't want anybody telling me what to write, and I never have. I never. I worked for both sides of the province in terms of the NDP government when they were in power, the PCs when they were in power. I never once thought that I was working for the political party. I thought I was working for the government, and that's to save my bacon on lots of times because I've been criticized by both sides. On a particular report, I'd say I write independently. You hired me independently. I write what I believe. And if it means you've got to unclutter the top end of your organization, I remember doing a review at the Alberta Gaming and Liquor Commission way back when the premier's office called me. And, you know, it's kind of lofty when that happens. You know, the premier's office called you. Ironically, I said to them, I said, you know, I'm really busy right now. If it's urgent, you're probably wise to go to plan B. And the deputy minister of the day said, George, there is no plan B. You're <laughs> in it. 
I ended up doing the review and I said to the province, you've got a major problem in the leadership at the board. You've got a major problem in the leadership of the executive and you need to pull the plug on both. And because they've been jerking each other around, you need to pull the plug on both the same day. And they did. I just think, you know, you can't allow that to happen. You've got to have confidence at the top. You've got to have a solid tone at the top. If you don't, Ian, as you know, you can dance around all you want. You can put all the uh, frills on the pig, but it still looks like a pig. And you, you need to be strong enough to say, if you really are intent on moving forward, do this. If you want to tickle around on the edges, go ahead and do this, 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 and this, and you'll make some modest improvement. And over time, everybody might forget about the big problem. The answer is they won't. And the big problem doesn't go away on its own. You have to tackle it. So either the organization will tackle it without you, or you will say to them, I did this study for you, lots of good things to tell you, but I'll guarantee you that's not going to happen unless this change is made. And I think as consultants, you've got to be absolutely determined that you're going to call a spade a spade, even if nobody likes what you're saying. The whole organization might dislike what you're saying. you still got to be strong enough to say, this is what's really the issue here. And you're going to get paid regardless, Ian. You're going to get, because people will say this person's calling the shots as he sees them. And I think that's critical. I would never, one of the reasons I haven't worked for major firms, I have on a contract basis, and I'm doing one right now. But the reason I haven't joined on as a partner is that I don't want to be a part of an organization that might say things that I don't agree with. I want to know if my name is on something, it's what I believe to be true. I want to jump in and uh, go to some of the reports that you've written, not saying what town or what municipality, but what's the reoccurring theme that municipalities and council face on a day-to-day basis when it comes to good governance. When you go into a council and you have to do an audit or you have to do an audit or a report on a organization, what's the one thing that you always see is always conflicting and you need municipalities and particularly councils to start thinking about it more often, particularly before they get to the point where they have to bring in George Cuff or Ian McCormick into an organization to try to help fix what's going on? Yeah, another good question. I would look at two things in particular that just come to the to my mind, so I'm speaking off the cuff. But anyway, uh, the, the first uh, issue is one of um, the credibility of reports that go to council. So are the reports of a quality nature where you can scan the first page and within one page have a really good understanding of what the, uh, what the issue is, what the options are, and you've got a recommendation from the CAO. Do you have that as a clear to you as a council? You can go all the stuff beyond that. You can read every other report, every other backup document, but is it clear? Uh, I call it a request for decision. Is it clear that the format allows you to make a good decision? So that's one. The second part of this, so that's part of the decision making. The second part of the decision making is, do you have a process that walks you from the issue to the decision? And does the process give you time to ponder? Does the process give you time to think through the issues? And so I would argue that councils historically have got it wrong in terms of how they use a committee, the whole structure, because uh, what they do is they shovel all the items on the agenda, put it to the committee of the whole, the committee of the whole takes it all up to council. All it does at council then is you simply baptize everything you did at the committee of the whole. And so it's a very short council meeting in most cases. Mind you, I've just now been finished reviewing an organization where the council meetings are run for anywhere from five to 14 hours. And so when you think you've got a long meeting, you could check in with me and I'll let you know some comparisons. But I would say that, and, and he knows because he's heard me talk on this ad nauseum, but the 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 quality of decisions is often a reflection of the quality of the process. So two things. One is the ability of a CAO to report accurately, fairly, comprehensively, and succinctly. The second part of it is, does the council have a process that allows them on the bigger issues of the day to reflect, to think? And in many cases, they aren't. They got the item, they've either shoveled it through all of the same as though every item is the same weight, or they aren't, or they've gone from issue to decision without pondering, without stopping. They go very quickly. Oh, there's the issue, there's a decision. And then they think, whoops, maybe we didn't really think that one through. Well, it's embarrassing. 
So, and again, I don't think committees should make decisions and most provinces are not allowed to, but in many cases, it's often looks that way, where it's you pass something on to the public works committee and here's half of your council that's left out of the picture. I think that's inappropriate. So what do we have with the committee structure? I think you've got to boil it down to what are the top issues? Somebody has to do that. And then do we have council's uh, concurrence on how we ought to address those top issues? So decision-making, at the management table, decision making at a governance review, and if you don't have the, those two coinciding, then you're ending up dropping the ball. Yeah, I, I certainly would agree. And I, I was speaking this morning with a, a the CAO of an upper tier municipality in Ontario, who is essentially echoing exactly that. that there's, so there's very little involvement that's happening. So anyway, George, we I, we're uh, kind of out of time, and I wanted to say so. Thank you so much. I always learn something new every time I have an opportunity to interact with you. And for some people, perhaps this podcast will be the first time they've heard you speak. So, thank you so much for being so selfless with the time you provided to us today. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for reaching out to me to both of you. Bless you. So, Ian, G is for good governance. Another great episode. G, 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 good governance. Great, George. Yeah, that was a lot of fun to do. I, I can talk to George all day. He seems like a wealth of uh, uh, information, and I feel like we just scratched the surface. Uh, for anyone who wants to get one of his books or read some of his uh, articles, a link to his website will be in the show notes. Highly recommend you check them out if you are as passionate about municipal government as Ian and I are and as George is. So, um, yeah, it was a great conversation with him. With that... Um, Last month, or last episode, we talked about uh, some upcoming by-elections. We have some updates on one. Uh, the village of Delia in Alberta, Jim Adams was the only person to file his paperwork, so he has officially become the councillor for the village of Delia. Um, there are soon-to-be-called by-elections coming up, one in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, for a councillor position. In Quinty West, Ward 2 by-election due to the untimely passing of Terry Cassidy. Point Claire, Quebec, District 1 uh, is going to a uh, by-election. In McBride, British Columbia, a councillor resigned uh, and a by-election is soon to be called. In Salmo, British Columbia, a councillor resigned citing health reasons. Reasons. Um, so, Ian... With that, we will be back in two weeks with a special episode. And why don't you tell the people what it's going to be about? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Just before we do, it's, it, uh, you, there are two by-elections you noted in BC. Uh, that intrigues me because BC had its election four months ago. So there's probably something to some of that. Some of it can just be family. Some of it could be something else. Anyway, you uh, made a reference. Yeah, our next episode, ra rather than following along the alphabet, we are going to spend a little bit of time talking about a symposium that Strategic Steps is hosting called Bucking the Trend. And uh, we made reference to this in previous episodes, but it's dealing with abuse in the political realm. So if you looked at uh, buckingthetrend.ca, you can have some more information there, but we'll talk about it more in detail next time about some of the issues we have seen about abuse, whether it's uh, among members of council or involving members of administration and the public too. So uh, Chris, I'm looking forward to having that conversation in a couple of weeks. I am as well, Ian. So with that, this has been the little political trenches, local government at work. Until next time, everyone, talk to you later. Bye, everybody.